Hey there, friends and art nerds. I've got another watercolor illustration and art chat to share with y'all. So this is inspired by an ongoing series of food illustrations. I'm trying to paint Louisiana specialties with Kara enjoying them. So these would be Ponchatoula strawberries. And I think if you're not from Louisiana, you're probably not familiar with Ponchatoula strawberries. But down here, they're actually a really big deal. And going out to Ponchatoula for the Strawberry Festival or going out to Ponchatoula to go and pick fresh strawberries is actually pretty important to a lot of families and an event that many people look forward to. And of course, delicious Ponchatoula strawberries find their ways into a lot of Louisiana foods. So I hope you guys are enjoying yourselves. You're relaxed, you're comfortable. Maybe you're drawing along. Maybe you're painting along. I sure am looking forward to hanging out with you guys today. So grab your paints, grab your pens, grab your pencils, and let's make some art together. So I'm starting with an unstretched but penciled watercolor illustration and the way I'm able to do this is using my blue line magic technique because for the most part I enjoy doing my sketching digitally using my surface book and sketching in Photoshop because it allows me to very easily resize, move, crop, place objects instead of having to redraw and redraw and redraw. I still do a lot of drawing traditionally, especially my yearly Lilliputian living challenge where I depict the daily life and world building of the Lilliputian world. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, generally I share that over on Instagram and Twitter, but this year I'm mostly sharing it over on my Twitter because for a, for a whole month I was evacuated to Luling, which is a small town other side of the Mississippi River actually grew up there and I didn't have internet access and I didn't have access to my printers I didn't have access to a lot of things so it's good to be flexible and to be able to make do so I try to maintain both being able to draw traditionally and how to adjust for that as well as sketching digitally which allows me greater precision and I tend to save that for more complicated illustrations and if you guys are interested in my process for that at some point at some point I'll record that for you guys so I can share it here so I want this to have a warm sunny feeling because strawberry season is kind of the middle of spring and Louisiana has some really beautiful spring weather. You know, there's things that we're just not really known for people in that people don't talk about it outside of the state. But having lived in other places, our spring starts at the end of February and goes on till May. And that's kind of when summer starts. And you have these really mild, sunny days, lots of wind. I mean, spring in Louisiana is just beautiful. And that's why it's my favorite season. Having grown up here, winter isn't super hard here. It's not super cold, but it's very humid down here. So even 30 degree weather, when it's really humid, it just gets into your bones and you just can't seem to get warm. So spring is such a welcome relief when it finally comes around. Well, I say finally, but it, you know, February, it starts getting warmer and we start seeing a lot more sun. But even winter in Louisiana isn't all 30 degree days. Louisiana is weird because you'll get 90 degree days in winter and I know some of you guys are saying global warming and it uh, you know I'm sure honestly uh, global climate change has really changed Louisiana weather a lot I was reading how it used to just be kind of like 60 to 70 maybe get up to 80 like all year round which sounds amazing and now we have you know 30 degree, 50 degree winters and 105 degree summers. So it has definitely changed over time. And I was gonna, oh, 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 oh. So, um, but 90 degree days in winter, I mean, that was part of my childhood. I can remember my friends going off to swim like in December, which sounds pretty wild. But you know, when you grow up with it, you just kind of take it for granted. And as a kid, I, I knew snow existed, like we'd gotten snow one time, but it wasn't until I'd lived in Nashville and really saw snow that I like understood like what a snow day was and understood what people were kind of talking about. I mean, we'd get time off for hurricanes, but we didn't, it snowed like once in my childhood, so we didn't really get, you know, snow days. 
Um, and I have to admit, I don't, I don't like snow. Like having lived in Nashville for seven years and getting iced into my apartment, I don't like snow. But fall color, the foliage changing is also something we don't really have here. Not the way people have it like anywhere else probably. Like, uh, like Nashville gets beautiful fall color. Like here in Louisiana, if the leaves change, they turn brown and drop off the tree and that's it. But like in Nashville and further north, you get gold and you get beautiful scarlet reds and you don't, you get like purplish reds and yeah, you do get some brown leaves. But I mean, while the leaves are on the tree, they're just absolutely beautiful. And that I'll actually miss. We'll not miss snow. We'll not miss getting iced in. We'll not miss the cold, but I do miss fall color. So this technique that I'm about to do is kind of neat. So if you've got a moment, I hope you guys will take a look. So I'm starting with kind of an underpainting and I'm kind of just blocking in the strawberries and I'm also using a warm blue and doing it wet into wet. So the areas, of, like the leaves that are close to the strawberries, I'm painting them red as they're nearer the strawberries and then blue as they move further away from the strawberries. And it's going to create this really nice depth of color as well as a hint of the local color influencing the blue around it and i apologize if you guys can hear a lot of echoing i am sitting on the porch of my new to me home uh, we after nine months of house hunting and looking at like 40 houses we're finally done we're kind of moved in everything's in the house it's just all in boxes we're currently painting and then we hope to maybe replace some of the floors but i really like this house and i really like the neighborhood and i'm sitting on the back porch and it's just beautiful out here i mean to be fair it is october and it's probably 60 degrees out here yeah yeah y'all can be jealous and the sky is absolutely clear and the birds are singing and there was a cicada screaming he's not ready for winter or fall either i guess um and we are finally no longer evacuated for hurricane ida so we were evacuated i was evacuated for a month and some change because we just could not get power to our house uh our our energy so that's the local power company they had lines down and they had lines to this house that had gotten like caught up in some of the trees that had been cut down that they missed fixing but also our the pipe that comes out of your house that the lines go into had gotten damaged in the storm so it just took a while for things to get straightened out and St. Charles Parish which is the area that I live in it kind of spans both sides of the Mississippi River I grew up on the west bank and now I live on the east bank um, got hit really hard and for a while there things kind of stagnated because Entergy wasn't fixing the power going to people's houses and there are all these piles of branches and trees which a lot of that is still around and then quite sadly a lot of people a lot of people had a lot of roof damage and thus they had a lot of home flooding and thus they had to get rid of everything they owned everything they owned was ruined and they had to pull up all their carpets and they had to remove all their sheetrock and they had to get rid of all their insulation so there's recovery is going to go on for a while and it's really hard to find like a roofer who has time to come out and, and fix your roof. It's really hard to find a contractor right now who is available to fix some of the damage in your home. So it, it did get kind of frustrating for a while because a lot of the businesses were back up, at least like Walmart was back up and a lot of the gas stations were back up, but a lot of people's homes are still unlivable. So, you know, we're in a way we're used to this because we're used to hurricanes and we know how to deal with hurricanes. And every, every area in the world has its problems. Um, cost of living might be crazy high. You might get earthquakes, you might get blizzards, you might get snowstorms, you might have forest fires, you might have winter storms. Like every area has its problems. So this is not gonna stop me from living and loving Louisiana, living in and loving Louisiana. It's just something that we're dealing with and it's something I was raised to know how to deal with. So it's not even as bad as when I lived in Nashville and we'd have flash floods 
because where I've grown up, you never, you know, it's, you know, it's going to flood. Like, you know, ahead of time, you're probably going to have some flood issues and you can take some precautions, but in Nashville, because of the hills, you'd get these rolling floods. So it was really hard. Like even just the thunderstorm could cause a flood. So it was just more, and then I'd get iced in all winter and having grown up in Louisiana where it has snowed five times in my life and I'm 35, um, you know, I've never had to deal with those kind of problems the way I had to deal with them in Nashville because I didn't, that's just not our climate. So, um, you know, every place has its problems, but I grew up here. I love the, the wildlife. I love nature. I love plants. So, you know, I just missed home a lot and I needed to come back. After using that blue and red wet into wet technique on the leaves, I filled in the strawberries, making sure to leave, or I'm working on base filling the strawberries, really trying to utilize my brush, not just to fill in the area, but utilizing the brush strokes themselves to create highlights and to create interest. And I'm using silver black velvet watercolor brushes, which I talk about a lot here on the channel because I really love them. See, there's the cicada I was telling you guys about. He's just not ready for it to be fall and I think I might be ready for it to be fall. We only get fall for like a week here and then it's like winter-y kind of sometimes. So um, after I do all this underpainting, I'm going to use some masking fluid to reserve the strawberry seeds just so that they're a little bit lighter than the strawberries themselves. So once all that's had a chance to dry, I'm going in with a darker, thicker mix of my reds. It's probably a mix of Holbein's Cherry Red and Winsor Newton's Alizarin Crimson, but if you're painting along, if you're painting strawberries, you can kind of go with what you prefer. I happen to really want to capture that kind of candy, shiny red that you get with like beautiful, ripe strawberries, and then the darker kind of purplish color, not quite purple, more like red violet as we move away from our light source. Painting strawberries is so fun, almost as fun as picking and eating them. So now it's time for the actual color of the strawberry. So as you guys can see, I grabbed some of the cherry red and alizarin crimson, and this gives us a really nice bright red. And you can build up the saturation as you go along. Since we're working with watercolor, it's really easy to do really light washes, or you can mix in a lot more paint and get something a lot more saturated. And that's, I think fewer people think this anymore, but when I was first doing, con like not first doing conventions, but when I was first showing people seven inch Kara at conventions, people were really surprised by how saturated I would get the watercolor. But I think people no longer just expect pa super pastel for watercolor. We can kind of expect a wider range. And in a way, YouTube has really helped make that more accessible because it's really easy to find good watercolor tutorials online now back back in the day sounding real old but you know back in the earlier days of the internet kind of back around y2k it was really hard to find art tutorials online 
it just, because at the time people didn't necessarily have digital cameras, they didn't have smartphones that could take cameras. Most people didn't have a scanner in their house. Your phone could not record video. So if you wanted to do a video tutorial, it was, <laughs> it was a lot of hoops you had to jump through. And frankly, I think smartphones have made sharing art tutorials, art how to so much easier. I mean, you've got everything you need in a single device. I do almost all of these things, all the steps on my Samsung. I was doing it on a Samsung S7 for like six years and now I have a Samsung S20 and I do it all on that. Take photos, color correct, record a video, edit video. And I mean, I know a lot of other YouTubers as their channel grows, uh, progress to more expensive recording equipment and I don't know, I not that I see that kind of growth to kind of merit switching over to something a lot more expensive, but there's a lot of channel, channels that also just like, um, uh, I want to say Dank Pods, but he review, he's Australian and he loves iPods and I don't know, he just makes me laugh. Anyway, he records on his iPhone. So I really love how accessible smartphones have made creating content, creating, making blog posts because you can get decent photos and then upload that to OneDrive from your phone. Or you can just like create the entire post if you have a infinite amount of patience from your phone. I, I, I hate writing stuff on my phone. Um, and Patreon will sure let you know like, oh, hey, I see you're doing this on mobile. The mobile platform is not so great. Do you want to use the app? So it's even they know it's kind of frustrating. But uh, in terms of like recording and editing video, it means, oh my goodness, I have this squirrel. I'm watching the squirrel shake his tail at me and try to make eye contact. Sorry, <laughs> funny, but distracting. Anyway, um, it just allows me a lot of movement, allows me a lot of accessibility. It means I don't have to sit at one, I'm not tied to one computer to do this. Now, does the video quality suffer? I'm sure it does, but it makes something that would be inaccessible, more accessible. And I am all for that. I love that idea. So I'm also doing some wet into wet where as I'm applying my first coat of like actual main color, that beautiful luscious red, luscious, I don't, bleh, can't say it correctly. Anyway, uh, I'm also dabbing in a little bit of naphthamide maroon mixed with alizarin crimson. So naphthamide maroon is a Daniel Smith color and it's this beautiful dark red violet. I use it for like everything. It's one of my favorite colors. And, uh, oh, speaking of today, I am painting with my daily driver watercolor palette. So this is my favorite watercolor palette. It is, a it is a Heinz 57 of basically all the professional grade paints that I've reviewed and I ended up really liking and it just works for me. And I talk about it more in a video that I'm going to link down in the description for you guys, in case you're curious, cause sometimes people are like, what are you painting with? And it's kind of like, well, I'm painting with whatever works for me. I'm not really married to a particular brand. I don't have any partnerships with anybody, but my patrons. So I kind of just use what I want. That doesn't mean I'm not open to creating, you know, videos, especially for, for brands that I use all the time, like Daniel Smith or Windsor Newton or Holbein or, oh gee, Golden. I'd love to do stuff with Core or Da Vinci or Paul Rubens. Um, it just means that we haven't worked anything out like that yet. So, and you know, I used to approach brands with those kind of ideas kind of before we had the big YouTube art names back when I was doing the blog. And at the time it was kind of like they couldn't see any point in those kind of partnerships. Uh, I know that's kind of changed, but I kind of feel like the tides have changed a bit with me.
So I think doing the underpainting where we have the really light pink color and then we have the more bluish purple color and I think I made that using the same color I used on the leaves which would be like a, a mimery blue kind of a, a warmer blue and I actually purchased some mimery blue because I've only ever bought a couple tubes because it's a little bit expensive so I bought a bunch of it when Blick was having a sale and I want to share that review with you guys because I, I like what I see of them and I'd like to see you know how they compare to the other watercolors that I use you know in the course of the past five years I've reviewed a lot of watercolors and I've discovered so many brands and so many properties of those brands that I really really like and I think playing around with watercolor and experimenting with watercolor and painting so many things and learning how to use professional quality watercolor but also learning how to get around student grade watercolor I think it's really made me a stronger artist and it, it hasn't necessarily unlocked all the doors I wish it is had unlocked but I am happy for you know the experience that I've had and I'm grateful that I had the ability to do that I mean it's it's expensive and it's one of those things where you have to watch for sales and you have to shop very carefully and you have to set aside a budget frankly like I don't have a lot of vices so watercolor is my big vice and art supplies are my big vice so in order to create a green uh, I'll wait till that truck passes I'm using a more opaque yellow so it's a cool yellow and I'm just glazing it on top of all that blue. And I love how yellow and blues, when you mix them optically, i.e. a layer of blue, a layer of yellow, I love how fresh and vibrant they look. To me, it just feels, it looks more lively than if I'd mixed the colors together to make a green and then painted with that. So that's one of my, it's not much of a tech, it's not like a super fancy technique, but you know, it's something that I think brings me a lot of joy. It's like a little bit of magic and I definitely think watercolor can be magic, especially when your paints do something really cool or you're able to execute just the technique you wanted or you started out with making a mess and then you were able to turn that into something beautiful. That's like, to me, that's magic. And I really love that about watercolor and I, to, I can't necessarily achieve that with anything other than maybe alcohol markers. I can sometimes do magic with alcohol markers, but with watercolor, most of the time I can do magic. And it's just so exciting and rewarding to do a little everyday magic, to be a little bit of a watercolor witch. talking about naphthamide maroon I definitely like to use it to help shade lighter skin tones it just it works super well to kind of create those skin tone shadows And now that that first layer of optically mixed yellow and blue is dried, you guys can see what kind of greens you can get with it. And you can still see a little bit. It's not like your brain doesn't automatically think, oh, she used red down there. But you can still see it a little bit. It still influences the color of the leaves. And if you look at strawberry leaves, they're a little bit shiny. They're a little bit reflective. So I think that works really well. I'm going to go in and do another layer with the yellow, just trying to build that up. And that's one of the reasons I also prefer watercolors that have a variety of pop 
properties, like when I'm reviewing professional grade watercolors, I wanna see some of them are more translucent than others. I wanna see some are more opaque than others. I wanna see some that granulate more than others. I wanna see some that are just very, very clean and finely milled. I wanna see some that are just a smidgen more granulating, but not gritty. I do not like gritty watercolors because I can really utilize those different properties once I'm familiar with the paints to do things that if everything was, was the same, you know, had the same properties. If everything was the same translucency or if everything was the same opacity, I would not be able to achieve those effects. This piece is part of an ongoing series. It got kind of stalled out, or it is kind of stalled out by the combination of Hurricane Ida and then the rigors of moving because we're still, <laughs> everything's in boxes. I'm working now from like a temporary workstation where I just cannot get the lighting right. I have enough lamps, enough natural light lamps to run a light store and it's still too dark which is because honestly I need an overhead light with a like a clean white light source and I'm just not able to do that in my temporary workspace right now I can't get a good overhead light because I'm working in our living room and it has a vaulted ceiling which I love but you know I can't exactly like switch out a light bulb and have it actually reflect the light that I want so um, I'm, I'm probably not going to paint in there for a while until I can get that figured out because I would just have to blow out all the colors in my recording on my phone recording software and it just wouldn't be a great it's not a, a great situation for recording watercolor right now so I'm going to try to figure that out and then I can start painting again but I, I've just got other priorities right now before I can finish up the Louisiana food series or keep working on the Louisiana food series but so far I have done snowballs I have done boiled seafood I've done beignets I've done strawberries Coming up, I have Creole tomatoes, I have sugar cane, I have Natchitoches meat pies, and then I know I have one, oh, Satsumas. And I might have one more other than that, but I want, I'm want i aiming for about 10, and then I wanna be able to offer these as Gickley prints and postcards. Uh, and you know, I'm sure it won't have legs outside of Louisiana, but it's nice to make things about here for here, because we tend, Things made for Louisianians in Louisiana tend to be very the same. And this is at least a little bit different from what's currently on offer. I mean, my comic, which <laughs> I can't believe I got through 30 minutes of this and didn't talk to you guys about my comic. So um, people who've been around art nerds know that I'm a watercolor comic artist. I've been kind of taking a bit of a hiatus since we published volume two because, you know, we were moving and getting married and then the hurricane. So we've got a lot on our plate and COVID. We've got a lot on our plate. So I've kind of taken a little bit of a break from writing and drawing comic pages. But I'm hoping after the Fall Fest in November, I can get back to working on comic pages again. But um, I've also, I missed it and I've also kind of not missed it because I've been really burnt out. Um, it's just, sometimes it can be really discouraging making a kid lit or an all ages watercolor webcomic and not being on like webtoons or tapastic. It's just hard to find your people. But um, I've been working on Kara for like 10 years now. Uh, I have two volumes out. Each volume is four chapters. It's all in watercolor except for bonus content. And uh, it's about a miniature girl named Kara. You guys can see her here enjoying a strawberry. Uh, just finding out that humans are not just the stuff of myths and legends, that they're real. And she's going to go out and meet one. And Kara is coded to be ADHD because at the time I started writing the story, there wasn't any positive ADHD rep for girls. And I wanted to create a character who was like me, um, had better experiences than I had. Her parents haven't like put her down for who she is. She didn't struggle through school or anything. And her personality is seen as an asset rather than something that has to be carefully worked around. So I wanted to create this ADHD coded character who has never been socially or emotionally punished for how she was made. And Kara goes out and decides to meet a human and she ends up meeting Naomi, a 14 year old girl who's just moved into the bigger house 
that uh, so Kara lives in a shed out in the yard in a dollhouse and Naomi has moved into the house that uh, her father grew up in and uh, she also has her pet kitten pancake with her and it's not yet explicitly stated in the story but her parents have just gotten divorced her mom had a drinking problem and her father decided that Naomi needed a better life which is based on my own life my mom left my father when I was 14 or 15 because his alcoholism just caused so much pain in our family and when I'm creating characters I take bits and pieces of myself and people I know and experiences and places I've lived like Naomi's house is based on the house that my mom grew up in and I just kind of like to weave all that together because I find that when you're inventing, when you're making things, it's nice to also kind of root them in reality. It makes them feel a little bit more real and it's easier to weave in personal things that will mean something to other people. So you can read, I haven't posted all of chapter eight yet. I'd put that on hiatus while we were in the middle of moving, but now that we've moved, I can actually start updating it again. But the, the first seven chapters are available as a webcomic that you guys can read at seveninchcare.com. Or if you're a fan of the dead tree format like I am, if you're a book hoarder, if you were a dragon and your hoard would either, either be books or pieces of art or art supplies, you can order your own copies at uh, the Natto shop, so nattosoup.com slash shop. And I will link all of those down in the description for you guys. It would really mean a lot to me if you checked out the web comic. It's free. Um, if you enjoy Kara and you'd like to help support it, but you are totally broke, I totally get it. It would also mean a lot to me if you took a moment and you, you know, recommended it to your library. If you filled out a library request form and that way they can get copies and more people can read it. And it would also mean a lot to me if you've read it as a webcomic, if you take a, take the time to leave a review either on, either on Goodreads or on Amazon because that helps so much more than you guys can know. And that's something that technically money can buy that, but that is wrong. So it would be a huge help if you took like three minutes and just wrote something. Even if you just wrote really like it, like the art, that really would mean a lot to me and it would be a big help. Once the strawberries have fully dried, I can remove the masking fluid and I use Winsor & Newton's tinted removable. The removable part is important. Don't get burnt like I've gotten burnt. Removable masking fluid and I'm using what's called a, a rubber cement eraser or a masking fluid pickup. Uh, you can find these things like even at Dollar Tree. I wouldn't say everywhere, but it's kind of surprising where you can find them and how little they cost. You can also get them at like Michael's, most art supply stores. But if you're on a budget, get it at Dollar Tree. It's a dollar. Uh, some artists can use their fingers. Some people, some artists can use the back end of a brush. I think that's really cool. I cannot. I guess I, I don't know why I can't, but I've tried and it just doesn't work for me. But the masking fluid pickup helps a lot and it costs like a buck and it just makes it so much easier and I haven't had as many problems with the paper tearing. And I'm pretty particular about which masking fluids I've used and my masking fluid methods and I've talked about those. Um, I think I have, I did a live stream during World Watercolor Month this year where I talk about some of my favorite watercolor techniques and of course I'll link that for you guys. I'm also going to link some of my favorite watercolor tutorials as well as some of my, of my watercolor basic tutorials. If you're watching this hoping I'll t talk to you about paint, like how to paint step by step, I've actually got a lot of tutorials for those but uh, people who hang out with me on Twitter and in my discord server the paint box have said that they prefer these chattier videos which thank you I appreciate that because I was getting kind of bored step by step by step because I was kind of repeating myself a lot so now I just point you guys to tutor two tutorials that I've already done that I think you should check out rather than you know reinventing the wheel and that frees me up to just kind of talk about stuff and to just kind of you know, share new things with you guys. So to paint plaids or checks like Kara's hair bow here, it's actually really easy. You just gotta be patient. So first of all, it really helps to think about what you're painting in this instance, a hair ribbon as a three dimensional object, which if you're not familiar with the object, like I actually own that hair ribbon. Um, so I'm pretty familiar with it. If you're not familiar with that object, it's really helpful 
to reference it and work with the reference. And that's going to kind of teach you a lot about how that form moves in space. But really, it's very helpful, if you can, to break things down into basic three-dimensional objects like spheres and cubes. And I actually have tutorials not only about how to draw those, but how to paint those that I hope you guys will check out. But if we're talking about the check pattern like in Kara's hair, basically, I'm always keeping in mind what I'm painting. So the hair ribbon, I'm keeping in mind how those shapes are tied and how they interact and I'm trying to make the stripes kind of reflect the curves of the ribbon and I do all the stripes going one way first let them dry using the same color or if you're doing plaid you can use other colors do all the stripes going the other way second and that way we have some overlap we have some optical blending and that kind of creates the check pattern where if you guys look really closely at woven checked fabrics like a hair bow like this you'll notice that where the two lines cross it's actually a darker square of that much like watercolor you can get optical blending with weaving as well so i just kind of keep that in mind when i'm painting surface design So in my opinion, color theory is not really my strong suit. So in general, I try to keep things simple. Uh, so I'm reusing the same blue that I used on the leaves for her jumper. And I find that like limiting my color kind of keeps my palette more cohesive. Sometimes I'll also pick like five basic colors and just continue to echo them either by, by changing the tint or by slightly shifting it in another like further along on the color wheel but not too too much uh, sometimes I'll go all in one or two color families with an accent color or a contrasting color but if I were working digitally and no shade I think this is really cool I wish I could figure out how to do this successfully with watercolor if I were working digitally I could tweak using you know different layer effects like changing like multiply or hard light or pen light I could throw an um like I could kind of create a mask and throw another color on there and then adjust that color saturation. There's a lot of options when you're working digitally that if you're painting, if your illustration is a mess, you can kind of salvage it by you know using layer effects and using multiply layers, things like that. With watercolor, it's once you've made a mess, it's a lot harder to fix that mess. So I generally try to stick to a more cohesive color story but since color theory isn't always my strong suit like I said I'll also solicit other people's opinions just like if I'm like painting something and I painted everything else but I haven't painted someone's shirt I might ask someone like should I go with a contrast color here or should I go with a complementary color or should I go with a color harmony like you know what do you think would work best here so getting an outside opinion or taking a break and stepping away and just kind of letting the colors dry and letting your brain have a moment to rest and kind of chew on it in the background can really help
So generally I try to keep these watercolor art and chats under or around 30 minutes. This one is closer to an hour. I've noticed that a lot of my paintings are just taking longer and I really hate time-lapsing things more than 8x because I feel like, like I share a lot of that kind of stuff over on like my uh, TikTok and over on Twitter, but I feel like if you, sh if you crunch something down more than 8x it's moving so fast that people can't actually see what you're doing if they want to follow along so hey now you got an hour's worth of company you can actually maybe get something done like the laundry or uh, doodling something so you know even though i know you youtube prioritizes longer videos i know there's like a sweet spot and generally my 30 minute videos tend to do a lot better than anything around or over an hour but there's just so only so much you can crunch something down you can time lapse something down before it just becomes like unintelligible so i i would prefer to have it be a little bit longer maybe get not get as many views on it but then again you've got people who want background company and they just kind of want to hang out and have someone to hang out with while they're painting or they're drawing or they're working on something else and that kind of allows them to do it. So once this has had a chance to dry, we're basically done, but I wanna go in, I wanna add some rim lights, I wanna add in some, you know, mostly when I bring out the watercolor pencils, I'm either adding highlights, I'm adding shadows, or I might be doing some surface pattern design or, or I might be trying to adjust a color that's just not quite. And in pretty much all of my watercolor videos, even the art chats, I talk to you guys about what my favorite watercolor pencils are. And this isn't really gonna be any exception because for all I know, you're new here. Hi, hello, welcome. Uh, so I like to use Karen Dosh's Museum Aquarelle, which are great, but they're expensive. And they have a limited color range, at least at David's Art Supply, where I like to buy them because I like to buy them in person because uh, I like to see what colors I'm getting. I also like Derwent Inktense. That's been a long time favorite of mine. They are indelible once they've dried. They are also way more saturated than you would expect when you wet them down. So you gotta use them kind of judiciously. And I also like Karen Dash's Super Color 2, which is kind of just like a good, fairly affordable workhorse. It's available in a lot of colors. You can find it at a lot of places. So if I had to recommend one, to someone who does not want to spend a lot of money, doesn't want to get super duper nerdy about their watercolor pencils, the Supercolor 2 are, you know, a good middle ground. The Faber-Castell Albrecht Durer are also a good middle ground. They are also, like the Derwent Ink Tents, they're also India ink, so they are probably indelible. And I actually have reviews for all of those where I made color wheels and I did color swatches and I also did color blending. I, I did that like last year. So if you're interested, you can definitely check that out and kind of get a better idea for it. And then once I finish with my watercolor pencils, I'm busting out my white gouache and I'm using that just for highlights. So a little bit of highlight on the hair, highlights on the strawberries, that sort of thing.
So this is one of the last watercolor illustrations I painted before we moved out of Norco. Kind of the last week before the storm, I was really pushing to get things finished up, to get things off the stretcher board, and to, I thought, get videos edited so I would have some buffer while we moved. But then Ida hit and we were displaced for a month and we were trying to get stuff moved into the house while doing that. But of course, if you have no electricity and you don't have any internet, it's harder and most of the stores are closed it's much harder to do the things you need to do around the house to kind of prep yourself before you know you've fully moved in so things kind of ended up taking a lot and are gonna take a lot longer than I expected but you know as always I'm doing the best that I can do and your support and encouragement really does mean a lot to me and I really do take it to heart I've tried to be fairly good natured through much of most of this it has been it has been a whole lot to deal with and there are but I keep in mind that there are people who are dealing with a a lot a lot a lot more than I'm dealing with so you know it's, it's always a struggle when you're going through stuff like you're going through COVID and you're going through a hurricane and uh, you know other people have it worse but you don't have it so great either so I've been trying to keep my head up for the most part I've not entirely been 100% perfect about being able to keep my head up but I will say things are a lot better now than they were when I did the narration for the rebirth video that was struggle bus because for two weeks everything stagnated for pretty much everyone and I wasn't the only one people were complaining on next door neighbor about how you couldn't get Cox out you couldn't get energy out you couldn't get a plumber out you just couldn't make any progress but thankfully things are much better now speaking of now now it's time to remove the blue tape from our illustration to free it from its confines once everything has had a chance to fully dry this was painted on Canson's Moulin de Roy which I happen to really like. I couldn't find it for a while, but I found out you can get it through Jackson's. And here we go, our finished watercolor illustration of Kara enjoying some Ponchatoula strawberries. So if you are a fellow Louisiana, give me a shout out down in the comments. I Sometimes I feel like I'm like the only Louisianian on here, which I know is not the truth. But if you are from Louisiana and you're watching this, even if you were born here and then you moved, let me know. It would be nice to, you know, see how many people who like kind of get what I'm talking about because sometimes I feel like I've started talking in like French or something and just speaking to a totally different world. I hope you guys enjoyed this watercolor illustration in art chat. I really enjoyed hanging out with you guys. My mom and brother are here to help paint so I got to get this wrapped up so I can help them out but it's been such a long while since I've been able to find any time at all to do any kind of narration or editing so I had to grab the hour I had while I had it and I appreciate their patience in waiting on me since they are doing me a favor and helping me out. I hope that this was helpful, useful, and informative for you guys. If you're looking for like a more straightforward watercolor tutorial, I have got so many of those for you guys, including tutorials on how to paint your own watercolor comics because I want to help you guys make art a habit. I think art should belong to everyone and I'm trying to make art and art education more accessible to more people. So if you guys are able to, if you enjoy what I do and you want to help support me, it would really mean a lot to me if you were able to join me over on Patreon at patreon.com slash natosoup. But even if you're not, I'm just so glad you guys were here to hang out with me today. And I hope to see you guys again soon. So I hope you guys remain safe, happy, and healthy. And I hope you guys have a wonderful day. And before we go, a huge, massive shout out, a big old thanks to my amazing patrons, my awesome art nerds who help make watercolor chats like this one possible. Thank you guys so, 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 so much. It really does mean a lot to me. So I will see you guys later. I hope y'all have a great day. Bye, guys.